All right, everyone, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Bill Daniels, and I'm the program leader for Native Seed Communities, which is a project of the Indiana Native Plant Society. We're glad you've joined us tonight for Ann and Ellen's presentation on uh, starting a native plant sale. This is a, uh, a presentation, I'm, or at least the, the activity that I'm quite familiar with because I'm also on the same team with, uh, with both of them. Uh, before I introduce them though, I'd like to share with you a little bit of information about uh, the Indiana Native Seed Communities. Uh, we promote networks of native plant enthusiasts sort of based on the chapter system of the Indiana Native Plant Society. And we are working together to regionally, uh, to collect, procure, to process, uh, and then to propagate native plant seeds to increase the presence of these beautiful and ecologically appropriate native plants in all of our landscapes. Uh, we, we've got a lot of resources on our IMPS website and social media. We've got an active Facebook group uh, that we invite you to be a part of. Uh, and we'll share all of that, all of those, uh, uh, the, the social media and, and our Facebook group and uh, our, um, our uh, website materials and so forth in the chat. Um, a, a few final notes before um, we uh, continue on with our our guest speakers tonight for the best experience for everyone. If you'd please keep yourself muted and unless of course you're invited to unmute. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and pop them in the chat. Sometimes it helps to put a cue at the beginning of the question uh, so that it pops out uh, for the, uh, uh, for in this case, Anne uh, Kamen will be, uh, will be fielding the questions as the presentation goes along. Um, if, if you're listening to the recording, uh, we're glad you're doing so. Uh, we would ask that you like this presentation. Uh, of course, the more people that like this kind of thing, uh, the more we're able to get out uh, the message of the importance of native plants and the beauty of growing native plants from seed. So please do so. Um, okay, let me introduce our speakers. A longtime gardener, Ann Kamen became involved in MC Iris after attending a snail sustain nature and your land day at the Bloomington, Indiana City Hall. One year ago, she received a, one year, I should say, she received a grant from the city to round up neighbors to help them remove invasive plants from their yards and has taught many neighbors how to win or sow natives using milk jugs. After organizing a few plant swaps in the neighborhood just before the pandemic, the native plant sale appeared to be an obvious next move. Anne has lived in Bloomington since 1977 and has always thought neighborhood involvement and grassroots activities were the most effective. And I actually live about three blocks from Anne on the same street, and I, I do attest to all the service she does for the community. Uh, and so uh, let me go ahead and introduce uh, Ellen. Ellen Jacart spent a career managing natural resources in Indiana, working for the Department of Natural Resources, US Forest Service, and the Indiana chapter of the Nature Conservancy before, before retiring in 2016. A major focus of her work was to address the threat of invasive plants to forests, prairies, and wetlands. When the Indiana Invasive Species Council created the Invasive Plant Advisory Committee in 2010, she led it until she retired in 2016. She now chairs Monroe County Identify and Reduce Invasive Species, MC Iris, which works to reduce the impact of invasive plants in Monroe County and was president of the Indiana Native Plant Society from 2018 to 2022. She is the winner of the 2022 Carl N. Becker Stewardship Award from the Natural Areas Association. All right, I now give you Anne and Ellen. Thank you, Bill. Yes. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I can find where is share screen. I am sure it is here. There we go. There we go. All right, so um, thank you for that nice introduction, Bill. 
And, and I'll say that uh, Anne and I are going to do this presentation. I'll do most of the talking and Anne is going to come in with uh, particular insights and additional information. And Bill, though, is one of the key growers for our plant sale. So, Bill, if you want to jump in at any point and, and uh, add in additional information, you feel free to do that. Thanks. All right. So um, as Bill said, both Anne and I are with MC Iris, which is Monroe County Identify and Reduce Invasive Species. We're here in Southern Indiana. Um, I am uh, currently the president of our organization and Anne is our native plant sale chair. Um, and so we're collaborating on this information. Now, MC Iris started in 2009, which makes this our 15th anniversary. And we are a partnership that works to reduce the environmental and economic impact of invasive species in Monroe County through education and action. And if you had told me back in 2009 that we should be running a native plant sale, I would have told you you were crazy because it, I would have said it doesn't really fit our mission statement. We need to educate people about invasive species and help them remove them. So 15 years, we've learned a lot. And I'm kind of going to go through our evolution in those years as to why indeed we took on uh, doing a native plant sale. Um, and yeah, I, if you do have any questions while we're talking, just put them in the chat and can interrupt me at any point with those questions and we'll um, address them. Okay, I'm going to give just a tiny bit on invasive species, just so we're all coming from the same place. I am guessing most of you on this call are very familiar with invasive species, um, but if you're not, invasive species are those species that are not native to an area and that cause harm, either to the economy, the environment, or to human health. And I'm going to give you just one simple example that I think most of us can relate to because everyone knows Asian bush honeysuckle. It is one of the most ubiquitous invasive species we have in Indiana. You can find it in the understory of many forests. I find it in wetlands. Um, I find it taking over fields. So it's incredibly aggressive. People who are not really up to speed on invasive species, I think have the sense that why we get so concerned about them is they simply, it, it's just sort of botanists that are worried about these invasive species displacing native plants. And that is true, that is a concern, but it's so much more than that. There are so many different impacts that a single species of, of invasive species can have. And Asian bush honeysuckle is a good example. So this is a picture of Asian bush honeysuckle um, uh, in flower here. Um, there we go. And this is it in fruit and this is what it looks like when it takes over the understory of a forest. This is in Marion County on the grounds of uh, Butler University along the White River Canal, where there is 15 foot tall Asian bush honeysuckle making a complete sub canopy under the forest. And when you have that kind of infestation, songbird nesting success will be significantly reduced because of these bare branches. When you have native shrubs, they tend to have lots of side branches and leaf, leafy material that actually conceal the nest, not Asian bush honeysuckle. If a songbird is foolish enough to put a nest there and lay eggs, the eggs are gonna get eaten. If they hatch, the nestlings are gonna get eaten by snakes, possums, raccoons, and so on because they are so exposed. It also, as you can see from this shot in the understory here, it decreases the understory plant diversity, the cover, the reproduction, and that includes tree seedlings. It, they simply stop the next forest from establishing. And that's due to both the intense shade that is cast to the forest floor and uh, allelopathy, toxic chemicals that Asian bush honeysuckle exudes that keeps other plants from growing. In addition to that, 
the big trees that tower above these shrubs actually have their growth reduced by over 50%. The trees, even though they're bigger than Asian bush honeysuckle, the honeysuckle has a more extensive root system and it's able to take the water and the nutrients right away from those big trees, thus greatly reducing their growth rates. And finally, another uh, impact that concerns most of us who go outdoors is the level of ticks and tick-borne illnesses that has greatly increased over the last 10, 15 years. And where you have these dense thickets of Asian bush honeysuckle, you will have higher population of ticks. And as a consequence, you will have more tick-borne illnesses in the human uh, population living nearby. So we're not just worried about wildflowers being displaced. There are a lot of different impacts for any given invasive species. And there's a lot of research going, is going on um, to sort out and learn more about all the impacts that they have. So that's why MC Iris was created to work on invasive species. I'm gonna go through just a few of the things that we started doing, kind of in chronological order. We, again, reduce the impact of invasive species through both education and action. And so this is one of the education ones. We wanted every landowner to be able to find out what was growing on their land, because often that is really hard to find out. Not everybody is good at plant ID. Um, many times in, in our county, in Bloomington, there's a pretty high turnover because of the university and people coming and going. And they come into yards and they don't know what it is they're looking at. They're inheriting all this stuff. They don't know, was that planted? Is this invasive? So we offer a free invasive plant survey to every landowner in the county. And we've done more than a couple hundred now. And it is by far the most successful thing we've done um, in the sense of giving people the information they need um, to know what to do next, to take care of their land. Um, and it's been really successful in that when you go to somebody's house and you walk their yard with them and you have nice conversations about their landscaping and you help them out, they have a tendency to want to help you back. So we've gotten most of our volunteers through going to their yards and helping them out and then they'll help us at events or at weed wrangles or so on. So this has been one of the most successful things we've done. We've also produced a lot of different publications like this uh, calendar of control. This is the MC Iris version of it that tells you when and how to control uh, the invasive species around our area. We have laminated invasive species. So you can actually see what they look like, the size of the plant, hold it in your hands. We table at a lot of um, local um, events so that people can get all of our information. We developed about five years ago, um, something called the Take Control Workshop. And this is like an intensive workshop for people who really want to learn the identification and control of invasive species. And it's about three and a half, four hours long. And the first hour and a half is in um, indoors and it's a PowerPoint where we go through, here are all the invasive species that are really common. Here are the tips that you can use to know how to identify them. And we go through in a PowerPoint, here's how you do control. Here are the three different application methods you might wanna use. Uh, here's what you should know about using uh, herbicides safely. And then when we're finished with that, we go outdoors and um, we get people set up with um, gloves and tools and herbicide and we all together just go through the area and cut out the Asian bush honeysuckle, paint the stumps um, and give people that hands-on uh, information. Another thing that we really focus on is early detection species. It's easy to spend all your time on Asian bush honeysuckle because it is so common and you can find it anywhere. But the best thing you can do is really watch out for new species in your area. And we've got a couple that um, are either very new in our area, like Mile a Minute, 
We have the only population in Indiana is in West Central Monroe County. So we've really been focusing on trying to help that landowner control it and also um, alert everyone in that area in case birds are moving it and spreading it. We adopted the kudzu sites that the DNR started um, controlling. And once they got it down to just a few, few vines, we take over and come in in July and August and finish controlling it, continue monitoring the site for like five years to make sure it doesn't come back. And lesser celandine is another example of a, a plant that um, isn't that common throughout the state, but there's huge populations in uh, Marion County and in Monroe County. So this is one we're focused on and helping people identify and control. Something that we added after a few years was the action part of this, weed wrangles. We started doing this by partnering with the City of Bloomington Parks and Recreation, and we had our first Saturday weed wrangle every month. And we would go to a different city park and we would just invite everyone, IU students, um, anybody that was in the area or interested to come and work with us to do control. And they're very, they turned out to be very popular and city parks saw that there was such a um, benefit to them. They wanted to increase the number of these weed wrangles. So we expanded that program. Um, and so it's gotten much bigger. There are weed wrangles just about every day of the week um, in the Bloomington area or somewhere in Monroe County. Um, we've got uh, city parks that got adopted by neighbors. So they're running the, the weed wrangles, um, others that MC Iris is hosting um, and so on. We've also started working with the Hoosier National Forest, um, Monroe County Parks and Recreation and other landowners, public landowners to help them with all of the invasives they have to control. Everyone's looking for help. And this is one way that we can help them as well as we can train people who come to these events. Ellen. Yeah, go ahead. Um, trying to get a name here. Uh, Alex is saying that he works with soil and water in Gibson and Pike County and wonders if you have any tips or a special process to, that you used for your invasive laminations? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. A little bit on that. I, um, I did these when I was working in Indianapolis and there was a, a print shop that had a super industrial laminator. And the key thing was that you needed at least an inch or two inches of nothing around the edge so that there would be a good seal around that edge. If there was a stem anywhere near, that would break the seal and then you it would eventually dry out and not look very good. Um, most species worked really well, especially herbaceous ones that you could put in a plant press and be really flat. One that did not work so well is calorie pear. It has a very brittle wood and even the small twigs were quite stout. And that one ended up causing some problems to the laminator. So you do have to look and, and you know, if there's anything more than, you know, a quarter inch of height, it's probably not gonna laminate well, even in a good laminator. And most places that have a good machine, you also choose what thickness of plastic you want. Use the thickest that they've got. The thinner plastic can rip if, um, you know, there's anything sharp on that specimen. Good question. Okay, once we had done like, I don't know, a hundred or so invasive surveys for individual people, we started hearing from some of them that it was a little d disconcerting to them that they were working so hard on their yard, but their neighbors weren't. And they invited us, would you come and talk to our whole neighborhood? And so neighborhood by neighborhood where there was were interested people, we would come and neighbors would gather in one yard or we would take a tour of the neighborhood and point out the invasives and go through all of the uh, information on control and bring the tools and have people work together on those. 
So we we started this sort of effort to get neighbors to organize their own neighborhood. Um, and that thankfully developed into a city grant program um, through our housing and neighborhood development um, program in, in, in uh, Bloomington, where they will give, if a neighborhood does organize, they'll give them a grant, a small amount, like $250, $500, but it's enough to rent a chipper if they want to chip up all the Asian bush honeysuckle that they control and so on. So we were, we were starting to scale up in how we were looking at the invasive species problems and, and what we could do. And then we started hearing from people who really didn't have tools. We would give them all this great information in the invasive survey and they'd say, okay, and where do I find these um, uh, herbicide dabbers? Where do I find weed wrenches? Where do I find all of these different things? So through a grant program, we got um, the tools to create eight kits that anyone can borrow for free. And we located them all around the county and um, they include everything. There's a, there's a plastic bag that includes everything you need to do herbicide except the herbicide. So that means you get the rubber gloves, you get safety glasses, you get measuring cup, you get funnels, you, you get... Um, Spray bottle safety glasses, hmm? safety glasses, safety glasses, dabber that you use to dab stumps. So all of that comes with it. And then we tell them, you know, store local stores you can go to to get the herbicide and how to mix it. There's a sheet on safety and mixing that goes with this, with the toolkit that we hand out. They keep the plastic bag with all that information, but they have to bring the, the tools back. Um, so a lot of people really went to town with these. This gentleman spent much of COVID out on his land um, using the weed wrench that's shown in this picture here to remove Asian bush honeysuckle and then piled it up um, in a parking lot. So um, they got really popular and people were excited about that, but we kept hearing the same question over and over but what do we plant after we remove the invasive plants? We in Monroe County didn't have that many places that were selling uh, native plants. And people were always looking for, you know, now I have this big bare area where I took the honeysuckle out. What do I put there and where do I buy it? And that we started thinking was a real lack in our community that somebody ought to fill. So we started very simply. We started with a reduce one invasive species challenge. And in 2020, we told everybody in the county, if you kill an Asian bush honeysuckle and send us a picture of the dead honeysuckle, we will give you a free shrub. And then in 2021, we chose purple winter creeper as our focus species. If you clear an area, I think we set a minimum dimensions of, of the winter creeper, we will give you ground cover species uh, that we bought from a nursery. And ultimately in this year, we now are uh, offering free uh, shrubs or trees if you remove a calorie pear, a Japanese barberry, or a burning bush. Um, and people can do two of each one. So ultimately you could get six different free native trees or shrubs. And that's how we started. And it was kind of easy because we just bought the plants in the case of the trees and shrubs from Woody Warehouse, which is just a fabulous place to get trees and shrubs at a reasonable price in Indiana. Um, and it didn't mean that we had to do anything other than have those delivered. But it wasn't enough. We kept hearing from people that well, it's great, but you can only put so many trees and shrubs in a small yard. People wanted perennials, native perennials, and there were really not many places that they could be purchased locally. So in 2021, we decided to hold our first native plant sale. And it was a really exciting thing that we've continued to do, but there was a very steep learning curve for us as well. And so we're going to talk about 
what we had to learn in order to put on this uh, native plant sale. A big one, we had to figure out how to handle money, talk about that, but legal requirements, if you are uh, doing a native plant sale in Indiana, how to grow the actual plants we would sell, how we would promote it, and then all the logistics that go into setting it up and running the sale. So handling money, MC Iris was not incorporated. And that was because I was kind of running the group and I did not want the hassle. I didn't see that we needed to incorporate because we didn't have any money. So if we had a grant, we did it through a partner. So IU, IU Indiana University ran most of our grants um, for the toolkits and so on. But if we were gonna do a plant sale and we made any amount of money, that money was gonna to have to run through someone and it was probably gonna be me and I would have to pay taxes on that money. And that convinced me that we needed to incorporate as a 501c3 not-for-profit. It was a huge step. I'd been avoiding it for 12 years. Um, it ended up not being as bad as I thought. They have really, um, I, I created a not-for-profit um, 30 odd years ago in Indianapolis, a Central Indiana Land Trust. That was much harder. We actually had to get a pro bono lawyer involved. These days, the forms and everything else are online. So it's actually a really pretty easy process to, to establish as a 501c3. But there are reporting requirements with it. So you're gonna, that's the that's the burden of being a 501c3. So we got that status and then we set up a bank account because the money is gonna have to go somewhere. Um, and uh, once we were a not-for-profit, we could set, sign up for a business account. So we were all set on that front. Legal requirements. So in Indiana, um, through the DNR, Division of Entomology and Plant Pathology, they have jurisdiction over plant sales. They require a nursery dealer license to buy and sell nursery stock, like when we are buying and selling trees from Woody Warehouse, we need a dealer license to do that sale. And we need a nursery grower certification license to grow nursery stock for sale, which we also do. And it can take up to three months to get those licenses, so you have to get them well in advance. Um, we're usually getting those in January. Once you have those, that's the first step. The second is when you do your sale, you have to have everything that you're going to sell laid out and then the nursery inspector will come and inspect it. And they're looking for um, insect problems, fungal problems, anything that they don't want sold to the public because you would be passing along uh, some kind of disease or insect pest problem. So that is something that you have to figure out in your logistics is when are when is everything going to be set up but before well before the sale starts so that the inspector can do the inspection. And of course different states have different rules so if you're from somewhere else you may have a completely different process to deal with. Okay, plant growing. So one of the things we really struggled with was um which species do we want to grow in terms of which ones are gonna be popular that people are gonna to wanna to buy and which ones can we grow successfully? It is a very different thing to have a spring plant sale versus a fall plant sale. We have a fall plant sale. We do it in September because we don't have greenhouse facilities and our little seedlings are not ready to sell in the spring. But if you are over summering all of your seedlings, um, sometimes by the fall, they don't look so good. Some species just do not hold up well, and it is hard to sell plants that look really crummy. So we've, as each year has gone on, we've focused more on the species that look good in the fall, uh, and people know they're getting a hearty, healthy plant. Um, we had to figure out how many species we wanted to sell and how many of each. One of the big restrictions you've got in a plant sale is space. 
we were very fortunate to have um, a warehouse space offered to us by our partners in um, City of Bloomington Parks and Recreation. Uh, they uh, let us use it for free, which is just wonderful. And so it's a matter of, well, how many tables can you fit in there and how many plant species can you fit on the table with signs by each species so people know what they're buying. And we've figured out, given our space limitations, we really can't do more than 100 species. That's kind of our upper. If we do more than 100, there's going to be some stuck on the floor somewhere because there isn't enough table space. How many of each we're getting, we, we did last year for the first time, we did a full inventory once the sale was set up and once the sale was finished. And we saw, and we had the people on the floor track, when did we sell out of particular species? So which are the ones that are go like hotcakes and which are the ones we are stuck with at the end? Um, so we learned a lot and it's, I mean, it's what you would expect. The big healthy looking plants go first. If they're in flower, they are going to zoom off the tables. The ones that look kind of sad or bedraggled, that don't have flowers, that aren't a well-known species, they're not going to go very fast. Anything that has milkweed in the name is going to go like that. Everybody wants milkweed. You cannot, I don't think we can grow enough milkweed to supply what people are looking for. Then we started looking at, well, who can grow these for us? Um, Bill is our biggest grower. He is really set up to do lots of plants. I'm probably the second biggest grower. I've made like a growing area in my yard that's deer proof and so on, but we need more than that. And so we have um, about a dozen, maybe more than a dozen. And how many growers do you think we have? I don't know exactly, but I think it is around a dozen. Okay. and. We track what they grow in a, in a public, uh, a Google Drive spreadsheet. So everybody can put in how many marsh milkweed they have, how many pots they have growing. Um, and, and we get a total of, by species and then total how many plants are underway. Knowing that as the summer goes on, we can lose some because insects disease, um, uh, things dry out quickly in the heat of the summer and maybe we don't get them watered as fast as we should. So one way we're looking at adding to those efforts is winter sowing events, which are hugely popular in our area. Um, this is uh, a winter sowing event this last year. We've got somebody handing out the seeds, explaining what species we've got. We give them the milk jug, they put the soil in, they spread the seeds, tape it shut, take it home. We email them every month, letting them know what they should be doing with that. And they get to keep, you know, the majority of what comes out of that jug. But if they have extras, we ask them to donate those extras to us. And that happens from like April to June, which is when we have potting parties. And the top picture, that's a potting party with Anne on the right. And we bring our milk jugs or whatever we've grown our seedlings in and we pot them up into uh, these uh, pots. These are the two and three eighths inch pots, 49 to a flat. That's kind of our standard that we use for planting. Um, and we standardize the pots because that really does help with the pricing. It makes it easier for everybody to understand how much each of the plants costs based on the pot size. Um, so things are going well. And then last year, it becomes apparent that there are Asian jumping worms in Monroe County, like a fair amount of Asian jumping worms. Like I found them in my yard. I didn't know I had them. And we, we, immediately asked all growers to test their soil. We handed out uh, like eight pounds of mustard powder, which you mix with a gallon of water, shake, spread over, and worms come up, and then you look for the identifying characters of the Asian jumping worm. So when we realized that some of our growers had, a, had uh, these worms and that we didn't want to share them uh, with people because they go into pots a lot because the pots have organic matter, the promix we use, and they're moist. And those are two things that Asian jumping worms just love. So we created a protocol um, to 
let people know this is our standard. We cannot guarantee anything, but we put all our seeds and plants in clean pots with clean potting soil. All of our growers test if jumping worms are found, all the plants are kept at least 16 inches off the ground to minimize the chance that a worm will go into the pots. And if they've been on the ground, you pour mustard water through them to get the worms to come out. And then we warn people that even with this, if you wanna be 100% sure that you're not getting jumping worms, either at this sale or anywhere you buy plants, you need to wash all the soil from the roots into a bucket before you plant it, filter that water, uh, and then dispose of it in the garbage. So this was a big thing we added last year. Promotion. Um, we don't do that much promotion. We make this card that you see on the right with the date and the time. And um, we hand those out. We put them up on bulletin boards in town. Um, we create a Facebook event, share it through our Facebook group. We share it with the local garden clubs who are um, you know, a big audience for us for this kind of thing. We also then promote it on the Indiana Native Plant uh, Society's Facebook group because that's a big one, over 70,000 members. Um, we also make yard signs. We have, I don't know, 20, 25 yard signs that look kind of like the same card, but it's yard sign. And we put those out the week before so that people know it's coming up and to go to Switch Yard Park. And beyond that, it's really word of mouth that gets the uh, information about our sale out there to people. Okay, and finally, logistics. Uh, this is where you, you learn by doing a lot. Um, first, you need the location. As I mentioned, we get free use of this warehouse that you can see in, in the pictures. You need a lot of room, as much as you can, lots of tables, and there's gonna be dirt on the floor. And you gotta have a place where it's easy to clean and your partner that is, or however you're getting this space, they're not gonna be upset about it. We arrange for all the plants to be delivered the morning before the sale. The sale's on Saturday. On Friday, everybody, you need to bring your plants by like noon. And we tell the plant inspector to show up at like two o'clock. And there in between that, those times, we are very quickly accepting delivery of all the plants that are coming in in trucks and cars. We check them in. The check-in station, they're looking to make sure that every pot has a uh, identifying label because we insist on that. We want every pot to go home and there's something that the person has so they know what they bought. Um, sometimes they come without labels and then you have one volunteer writing out those labels to, to put in. You also make sure it's the right identification, that there are plants in every pot, that there aren't any dead ones there that you just take out. And there are no obvious insect or um, fungi problems. And at that point, then once they're good, they get put into um, the table system. It helps to put things in a logical order as much as you can. This is what we've developed over time. We have three rows of six tables each, and each table is six feet long. And we start with uh, dry soil species, medium soil species, and in the back is the wet soil species. So we do it by soil moisture. Within soil moisture, we do sun on the right side, shade on the left side. And you know, in a perfect world, it would just be dry, medium, wet, but there's way more medium plants than anything else. So they kind of slop over onto the wet table. We then have signs on the table at the beginning of the end of each category so that people can see what um, culture requirements there are for the species they're looking at. This map is then posted everywhere so people can see what the organization is. It is hard to overemphasize how difficult it is to see anything once the room is full of people. They're covering up signs. They're covering up uh, the signs on the table. So the higher on the walls you can put these things, the better. 
or even if you want to create a handout that you can give to people so they have it in their hands. This also has a little QR code here. That QR code, when scanned, takes you to the species list that's also on our website so that they can have it on their phone. We have a lot of signs. Um, the pricing, this is our plant pricing sign that we've used, the small pots, um, medium pots, and large pots. And we do it to scale so that this ruler is the right size so that people can actually measure the pot that they've got so they know which it is. Um, one of the issues we have every year is credit um, sales. We really want to be able to do credit sales. We always seem to have technical problems that can make that tricky. Um, we had three credit card readers last year for three cashiers, and I think only one worked, maybe two worked for a while. So you end up, we end up doing a lot of cash. We're, we're getting a portable hotspot this year and hoping that that will help with the connectivity issues because most people would prefer to use a, a credit card when they're buying the plants. So testing it out in advance is a good idea. Okay, volunteers. Volunteers are crucial. Anne went in and counted up how many volunteers we had last year, because I thought it was 50. And she said, no, it was 80. We had 80 volunteers, which seems ridiculous, but um, we're fortunate in that we're with Bloomington, we've got Indiana University and students looking for service hours. We've got um, you know FFA group, a lot of different service groups that'll come and help out on a day like this. We use them to do everything from um, tallying orders, like right here, People may buy just a few plants, but we'll have people that are buying, they bring their own cart and it's full of, you know, 60 plants. And if that shows up at the cashier, it takes the cashier forever to sort through and figure it out. So instead we have talliers tallying their um, ticket um, and the total cost. So they can just hand that to the cashier and make these lines go faster. You can see this, this line is to about out there and, that's, that's not bad. Sometimes it's gone much longer than that. We use some to help take purchases to cars, especially for the heavier trees. Um, we have people just focused on keeping the floor clean because there's dirt everywhere and then people are kind of uh, slipping in it and tracking it everywhere. We have greeters who are right at the door and are um, showing the map to people. And if people have a particular species they're looking for, they point them to where they can find that. So a lot of different volunteers doing a lot of different things. Um, be ready for, oh, uh, the orange shirt. That was something we bought early on. And every year we just get more shirts as needed for volunteers so that everyone, all the customers can see who our volunteers are. And um, so they know who to ask questions of. Um, botanical, well, for the expertise, uh, botanical expertise for the check-in, um, you need at least a few people who know plants well so that they can answer questions about, is this really that species or is it something else? Um, uh, and helping them know what the culture requirements are for a species. Be ready for, oops, sorry. Be ready for leftover plants. We sold, we brought 4,800 plants last year. We sold about 4,000. We had 800 plants left over at the end of the day. At the end of the day, you are so exhausted, you really don't want to deal with leftover plants. Fortunately, our wonderful partner, City of Bloomington Parks and Rec, who gives us the warehouse for free, we give them anything left over so that they can put it out in the city parks. So it's this great um, partnership that allows us to not have to worry about them when, when the day is over. And it gives the city uh, plenty that they can put out in their parks uh, in the landscaping. One thing we started doing last year that was helpful is that the people on the floor who are answering questions and restocking when we sell out of something, they track when we sell out so that we know how fast things are going and which are the popular ones that we should get more of next year. 
Okay, I think this is it. Through the uh, MC Iris Native Plant Sale, we have provided over 10,000 native plants for planting in our local area. That's for the three sales that we've done so far. And the, the total uh, gross income was $60,000. Uh, that we then use to use for our re replacing invasive plants to buy the native plants, trees and shrubs. We do scholarship um, to let to have people go to uh, invasive species educational events for free. We have a new school grant program where we pay for schools to remove invasive species from their landscaping and so on. And so that's that's the whole nine yards and the information on this year's plant sale is uh, up here on this slide and we'd be happy to um, take any questions. I will give you a couple of questions that came up on the chat. Um, so uh, Susan asked about uh, a growing location for the license. Does it have to be on the, is the license say that the growing area is just Bloomington or Monroe County? It doesn't have to be the actual address of where the plant was grown? Correct. It's an entity is getting that license. So MC Iris has that license. So everyone working with us on growing is covered with that license. Another question was, <laughs> um, are your laminations using fresh or processed and dried plants? I think you said they were uh, processed, right? Yeah, I pressed, pressed, they would pressed, pressed. but they weren't real old. Um, they would be dry, but you know, it was within like a month of pressing them. So they still had good color at that point, um, which most, not all, but most retain the color pretty well. Okay, and at the end of, Bill is going to include uh, the MC Iris address at the end of this, so you'll all have that. Um, the Someone asked for the items that are actually in the tool bucket, and that will be in our website. We have the actual tools that are included in the bucket. Um, and if you wanted to contact any of us, that information is also going to be there. Anybody okay. else have any questions? I see Don't a forget hand to raised. unmute. I see uh, Caitlin Creasel has her hand up. Caitlin, you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you so much. This has been very helpful. Um, I work for a local municipality in central New York. Um, and I'm wondering, like with the legal side of things, are you a like a licensed not-for-profit? Like, are you a 501c3? Do you know how a government agency or might be able to do this? Um, good question, Caitlin. Um, we are 501c3, but that's irrelevant. Anyone can apply for a license. Um, a government agency can apply for a license. If the DNR was doing plant sales from a different division, and they do, they should have a license through the state uh, in order to do this. That's the Indiana law. Now, New York, I don't know their um, protocol, but you might just look up um, nursery growers, no nursery dealer licenses in New York um, and see what you can find out. All right. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, Susan, I see another hand up. Do you have a question? Susan, you're on mute, so you would need to unmute if you wanted to ask a question. Yes, and I just forgot what I was going to ask, so I'll try to think about it and put my hand up again. <laughs> okay, that's oh, fine. Um, I, I see. Know what it was. <laughs> Go ahead. Can you send out a, a list of the plants that you do sell? And the, it's on and... our website. Oh, okay. All right, great. Yes. Thanks. And I think Deb just put our website in the chat. And if you go there, just look for the native plant sale. Uh, it's under projects, native plant sales, the first one. And I just put the perennial list up last week because it usually takes us this long to be sure what we're going to be selling. Um, so we've got trees, shrubs, and perennial lists on our website now. Uh, 
Let's see, a couple other questions, uh, Ellen. Do you gather your seed or do you buy the seed and distribute to your volunteers? We almost entirely uh, gather seed. Um, Bill has been a big help on that as well. You know, there have been seed collecting events um, and each of us, I know I collect a lot of seed from my plantings. Um, we then uh, use that for the winter sowing events and for sowing ourselves for the plant sale. We also have an interesting thing through the, the Indiana Native Plant Society. Um, at our annual conference, which is usually in October, we have a seed swap and people bring seeds from their yards labeled. And then if you bring seeds, you get to swap seeds and take something else home. And there's usually a lot of seed left. And I should say, Bill is like co-chair of that effort with Mark Sheehan and um, they are left with those seeds. So sometimes we end up with species that we didn't actually collect, but generally we don't have to buy seed. That's great. <laughs> it's a huge savings. Yes. Uh, let's see. Megan has asked, is there information all on your website or uh, that you can share on how you ran the winter sewing event? Um, the last, your last winter sewing event? Yeah. I don't think there's really much on the website, uh, but basically we, um, it was pretty by the seat of our pants, I'll be honest. I mean, that's how I felt, Anne. You, you were very involved in it. I'll, but I'll give you the gist of it. You find a place. Again, remember, when you're working with dirt, it gets on the floor. Prepare for that. Uh, find a place. Take some dirt. Uh, take a bucket of water or make sure there's a water source. Uh, have somebody bring a variety of seeds. Uh, and we had we did the milk jug method, and we were able to get some people brought their own milk jugs, and some we got from our uh, county recycling place. And you slice like three quarters of the way around the milk jug so that there's a what do you call it a hinge, hinge. It? a hinge. Yeah, uh, put the dirt in it. Make sure you've got holes at the bottom so there's drainage. Put the dirt in. Put the seeds in close it, put a closer on it, like a duct tape or something, water it, uh, send them home. <laughs> Say, let us know when you see little green things. <laughs> and, and we clean up and that's about it. Yeah. It's, it was a lot of, it was a surprising amount of fun, uh, something to do in the winter. And it was kind of popular. I, I feel like we had at least 50 people at each one. Yeah. And a lot of times people bringing their kids so that their kids got to grow something in a milk jug. And then, yeah. um, you know, we would benefit from if they had excess seedlings or wanted to come to a potting party and bring what they grew, we could use that for our sale. Yeah. Yeah. I participated in a um, with third graders at one of the elementary schools here in Johnson County. And they were they wanted to have some natives for their education area for the school kids but then they have a lot of seeds left over in seedlings so they're always looking for places that they can donate um you know the extra seeds seedlings too so that's a great idea and great way to to gather more seeds for yourself and for your parties a uh, lot more questions have come through we do uh, so i'll just keep going um is there any concern you have, Ellen, about your seeds being hybridized or any other issues that you might have? Great question. Um, yeah, there is. Um, not just hybridizing, but are they correctly identified? Um, we had a few last year where the nursery inspector was disagreeing with the identification that the grower had on it. And um, I think we've sorted that out. But you know, and when you're getting seeds from a seed swap, sometimes the name that's on the envelope may not be 100% accurate. So um, from that standpoint, having people who can look at the seedlings and know what it, make sure that it is what it is labeled as is, is a good idea. We have talked about the cultivar issue. Um, so in a few cases, we're selling uh, offspring from a cultivar, like a switchgrass cultivar, uh, and selling plants from that. But we just sort of 
put that on the sign that it is a cultivar. Now, you know, is it breeding true to that cultivar? Probably not, um, you know, but uh, it's probably genetically different, but um, it's hard to say. So um, aside from that, but the hybridizing, I don't know that we really have much hybridizing going on between species that were growing, so. Yeah, good, yeah. good. Um, Adam, uh, who is in Tippecanoe County, says he doesn't have a bill. Uh, Adam, I think you need to get a bill <laughs> to help you. But uh, was uh, asking about any resources or or to help with the gathering of seeds and in, in getting started um, that you might offer, Adam. Find a bill. <laughs> well, I would say I, I I do think that you folks have ha have resources on your uh, YouTube channel and and the native mm -hmm. seed communities group I think has addressed that and you know how do you get started with planting seeds and so I, I would direct Adam to those resources and see if there's something out there um, that would would help with that you might look for local partners because often the soil and water conservation district uh, might be interested or uh, other partners. And Adam was at Tippecanoe County because yeah, you've got a lot of seed collectors up in that neck of the woods. So I, I think the Soil and Water Conservation District, District is active with that. Um, but um, yeah, it, there's, there's resources online that you can start with and just start with a few species and kind of learn as you go. Oh, what, uh, uh, this is Bill. What, uh, what uh, county, I mean, what uh, chapter is that? Ellen, do you know? West Central. West Central. Okay. Yeah, so uh, absolutely. There are some people there doing that. Maybe uh, maybe you could get a hold of me. Uh, just send a note to seed at indiananativeplants.org, and I can connect you up with some folks that are doing similar stuff. Great. Great. Thanks. Uh, we'll keep going till we get to the end of the uh, the hour here. Is there a, a big difference from seed gathered in Indiana and seeds bought from other native seed sellers, such as Prairie Moon, Nursery Grown In, Milk Jugs? I don't really have an opinion on that. I haven't done any sort of side-by-side -side comparison and, and where I've had like locally collected butterfly weed or butterfly weed from um, Prairie Nursery, you know, they've behaved the same way. Uh, it's possible there could be differences, but that the little experience I've had side by side, I haven't seen any. Um, yeah, I've I've purchased personally my myself seeds from Prairie Moon and a few others, and you know, as far as I can tell, they look the same, they act the same. Uh, some actually grow taller than I was planning on, but um, you know, you I think ideally they people do think if you can get a local. A supplier is best, but uh, that's not always possible. Mm -hmm. A lot of thank yous, great information. It looks like a lot of people very much interested in in what you've done, and sounds like a great event. And you you keep improving upon it. Um, could Pollinator Partnership be a good resource for that? It's probably yes. I would yes. say so. Uh, well, uh, I do have a question. Um, you mentioned that uh, you 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 have floor locators and they're watching what you're running out of stock on, um, and so you can make notes for the following year. Do you have plants that were very successful and a really popular one year, and then all of a sudden you have a lot of them, and then it's not as popular the following year, or do you find that what is popular tends to continue to be popular? I think what tends to be popular continues to be popular, especially if the plants are good looking. Yeah. Like, you know, if cardinal flower, if you've got big, healthy looking plants and if they have flowers on by any chance, they are going to be really popular. If you have teeny little rosettes of cardinal flower that don't look like they're really going to survive, they're not going to be a popular. But the, the big ones that seem to go fast are all the milkweeds, cardinal flower, great blue lobelia, Anything that has a showy flower, um, uh, boy, the cone flowers, pale co cone flower, purple cone flower. Um, By the layers, probably, probably go to. Oh, yeah, yeah. blazing stars, yeah. sure. Yeah. 
good. Okay. Good, good. All right. I think we've pretty much come to the all the questions. Uh, thanks again so much to you, Ellen and Anne, for great information. I'm going to turn that over to Bill. He can wrap up and talk about uh, next month's presentation. Well, uh, thank you, Deb, for helping uh, field the questions and everything. And thanks so much, Anne and Ellen. Just really <laughs> excellent. And I, I must say, I've I, it's just a joy to work with you both and such uh, such powerhouses when it comes to organizing and competence. And and so anyway, it's been a lot of fun and looking forward to continuing to to work with you all. I, I will I find it interesting. Anne was talking about how I mean, uh, uh, Ellen was talking about how some species don't do well as the summer goes on. And some species are really popular. Well, unfortunately, I was just looking at our common milkweed out there. Um, I've got several flats here and others have uh, several flats and we've grown a lot of them. Well, they're starting to really go downhill and they do that every year. I've been doing this, I think about eight years. And uh, and so they do, they, they do it every year. It's frustrating. Now yeah. we do have a have a sale uh, the, uh, another partner is our Sycamore Land Trust, and we've got a, a nursery out there, and there's sharing back and forth of seedlings and seeds and stuff like that as well. And um, we have our sale for that group in the spring. And so we overwinter our, uh, at least the, the plants at Sycamore Land Trust, we overwinter those. And uh, Boy, in the spring, they're beautiful. And But anyway, that's just part of it when you're doing this kind of thing. But I will go ahead and wind up. Um, and uh, if you have any additional questions uh, regarding the presentation or Indiana Native Seed Communities, uh, feel free to reach out to the links that Deb has uh, kindly put into our chat. Um, you can also um, be a part of our email listing. Uh, send a note to seed at indiananativeplants.org, and we will get you on our email list. It's primarily just communications about, about the presentations, and periodically um, we do share other information, and Jillian Harris is on, on the phone, and she helps, helps with that and leads that. She does a fantastic job of that. Um, do join our Facebook group, and uh, we've got, I think, well over 3,000 people. Um, and, uh, you know, we were especially interested to see uh, and hear, see in pictures and hear in text how your growing is going. Our next presentation uh, will be Monday, August the 19th at 7 p.m. Eastern, not 5.30 this time, but at 7 p.m. And for this one, we'll be having a community herbalist, actually, um, he's on our uh, Native Seed Communities um, uh, Committee. His name is Greg, Greg Monzel, and he'll be presenting Seed Saving for Sustenance, Foraging to Farming. And Greg is really terrific, and hopefully many of you will be able to join us. Uh, all right. Thanks again, Ann and Ellen, Deb. Really appreciate it. Um, it was good to see you all. Uh, we'll sign off for now. Have, have fun growing natives from seed. Bye-bye, all. Thanks.